Okay, and you're live. Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to the last webinar for this week. As always, please feel free to ask any questions you may have, and we'll address them at the end to Prakriti Paul, our guest for the evening. Prakriti, it truly is great to have you with us. Why don't you start by introducing yourself first? All right, thank you. Um, so I'm Prakriti. I graduated from TISB in 2011. Um, the first thing I want to mention is I had a really wonderful time there and two of my best friends who I made there, we are still best friends now. So TISB is special both academically and also in a personal way. Um, so after graduating from TISB, I went to MIT and majored in um, biological engineering. Um, so that was the place where, as I guess cheesy as it may sound, where I fell in love with research. Um, I had my first research experience um, the summer of my freshman year, and I was very privileged to have worked for Nobel laureate Phil Sharp. So I think for the bio crowd out there, um, he was the one who co-discovered alternative splicing. So that was so it was very exciting to interface with him and other people in the lab. So my first lab experience was heavily experimental. So you know I was running. PCRs and gels to understand how an RNA binding protein called RBFOX2 regulated, you know, various aspects of alternative splicing. So I was really zooming in into, you know, one mechanism in several cells, but that's when I became very captivated by molecular biology. Um, so I was there for about two years, and then I wanted to try something more analysis based and maybe more translational. So I spent um, a year at um, a lab in Harvard MGH and uh, MGH is Mass General Hospital. And over there I studied the pharmacodynamics. So basically how drugs work um, uh, in various um, cancer cell lines. And so there I did a lot of imaging, um, image analysis, and then really to kind of quantify those effects. So that was a very different research experience, but it kind of reinforced that I'm interested in um, mechanisms and I'm interested in a very quantitative way of thinking. Um, so that's kind of the research aspect at MIT. Um, and again, on a personal level, I of course spent a lot of time on research, but I had a very holistic experience. Um, again, I made lifelong friends over there. Um, I had mentors and I cannot emphasize the the importance and the role that mentors can play. So that's one thing I'm going to tell you right now. You know, look for upperclassmen, look for professors who are going to believe in you and guide you. So that was a huge plus. Um, I was also on the Bhangra dance team for a semester. Then I was on an African dance team. I had the opportunity to travel to Ghana. So there were a lot of other things that happened and made my time at MIT really special. Um, so then after graduating from MIT, um, I enrolled in a PhD program at Caltech. And so again, I went in with the expectation of I'm going to do experimental things. I'm going to, you know, like analyze data. And then I started taking some math and computer science courses and I was completely captivated by that, like so much. Um, I think, you know, that it, it, it's like solving puzzles. I, I really enjoyed, you know, thinking algorithmically. Um, but when it was time to pick an advisor, and I can kind of explain what the PhD experience is like. Um, in brief, it's as a student, you want to get matched with a professor who you have similar interests with, and then you want to work on a problem or several problems over the course of hopefully not more than five or six years um, in which you build skills and you add a piece of knowledge to what we already know. So when I wanted to bring those two things together, um, really like algorithmic practical aspects of computer science with biology, I was unable to find an advisor. And so I reapplied for PhD programs and now I'm now I found myself in Princeton. And again, I feel very fortunate where I'm able to now meld those two areas of research uh, very creatively. So I have two advisors. One advisor um, is a very prominent developmental biologist. Again, for if you are aware of the Hox genes, um, they're like a battery of genes that are highly conserved and basically control developmental patterning. So that was a really um, seminal discovery. So I'm lucky to be advised by him. You know, he generates all this data. I get to think about development and evolution, and then I have a computer science advisor. So she has been trained, you know, in math, <laughs> like. 
solving theorems, but she's very practically oriented. So now I'm able to essentially not just analyze my data to explore these biological questions, but I'm now, you know, developing algorithms to now play around with that data to tell us things that are that you cannot understand given existing tools. Um, so that is, I guess, like that would sum up my professional life. Um, and I guess one thing that I want to mention is um, in between my time be, uh, between Caltech and Princeton, um, I was able to, again, very fortunately work for Shinya Yamanaka, who is um, a Nobel laureate who discovered iPSC cells. So that was really cool. Um, and again, that's, uh, I'm, I don't think I need to explain what induced fluoropotent cell, stem cells are, um, but they're really cool where you can take any cell in your body and turn them back into a form that can then turn into anything else. So that was also a really awesome experience. Um, so yeah, feel free to ask me anything about you know the research process, what it means to do that, what interdisciplinary research is, because that's um, very prevalent now. And also any like, I guess more personal questions about how do you find mentors? Like why, you know, how do friends make such a big difference in your experience and in your, in your life? Um, how I ended up getting these opportunities. <laughs> um, that's been something really remarkable and maybe I can tell you some helpful things. Um, and yeah, so feel free to ask me anything. And thanks for having me. I appreciate that. And Abhigyan, can you tell me like how many people are here, what um, years they are, maybe general interest? Hey, sure. So we have about 35 people here right now. And mm -hmm. while we can't, really see who the people are. We know that like they're from the grades 9 to 12th. And so general interest, I think it's just like the institutions you went to and the field you're doing. So because this is an event that's completely voluntary to attend, you can safely assume that everyone's interested in what you have to say. OK, OK. Amazing, and I mean, it's our absolute pleasure to have you here with us. So maybe to begin with the questions, um, and on a personal note, why did you choose MIT? Um, so at TISB, um, I had, you know, I guess like potential for both science and humanities. Um, like uh, in humanities, I did really well in like history. I really enjoyed that too. Um, in English, I, I was like strong in English, but I'd say like I became and I still am the most captivated and kind of obsessed by science. Um, so that was one uh, one area. So when I was applying to college, I was encouraged to, you know, also apply to schools like Brown, you know, where it's like very free flowing. I can customize things, but I started to recognize that I really wanted a rigorous science and engineering education. Um, but at the time, you know, like, you know, MIT felt so elusive and scary. I'm like, do I belong there? People are so intense. Um, but they have this really cool blog where undergrads kind of talk about their experiences and what MIT is like. And I stumbled upon a blog written by Chris Sue, who ended up um, being in the dorm that I lived in. Um, and he's just such a wonderful person. And the blogs he wrote were so personable and it shed a completely different light on MIT. You know, it was a place and it's true, like it's a place where people are really into what they do. They're interesting, um, they're really humble. And, you know, we were all miserable um, a lot <laughs> because of the brutal course load and expectations. But what he communicated was, we and we were not competitive really, except for maybe the pre-meds who had to go to medical school and they have very, you know, like ridiculous standards for getting admitted, especially in terms of their GPA. But the rest of us, um, we worked together. So we kind of joke that we were miserable together, um, but that was that was really special. So after I got my college admitted uh, admittance admissions, um, you know MIT was definitely at the top, but it was reinforced by having learned about it and also having talked to the people who went there. So I'd say it was like obviously for the education, but really the people who I felt like I would be able to meet, and that turned out to be really true. That's that's great to hear that you had such a positive experience. So for a lot of us, MIT is very scary, honestly. So for you, 
what was your expectation or idea of college life before you went in and how significant how significantly did the reality differ from that idea of college in your head so um i'll start with the not negative but kind of more challenging thing so i knew that mit would be hard i could not conceive how hard it would be at all um and so actually what happened to all of us every single one of us um and and also just to give you guys a perspective genius is actually very rare okay like i've had professors say that maybe them they met like five in the course of their entire careers at mit okay so i just want to demystify this fact that we're all geniuses no i mean we're extremely intelligent that is true we're we are extremely capable but we got honestly just like beaten down at some point um i can tell you from personal experience so for me you know at tisb the hardest you know challenge that i had was taking math hl so you know how there's like a screening process so i can't, um so i didn't take what was it called like advanced math in 9 and 10 uh so but i wanted to do math hl in the screening test i got a 3 um i don't know if you know miss vijay lakshmi she was a great math teacher she's like Prakriti don't do it and I'm like no I'm going to do it anyway. And so like I struggled and then moved from a 3 to a 6. It wasn't a 7, but I made tremendous progress, but that was hard for me. Um at MIT it was like 50 billion times much more difficult. Um our first semester we have something called pass no record. So what that means is you know you're not given a grade from A B C D. It's like if you get A B C you have passed. if you fail it's like a no record on your um on your transcript so basically um in my first like chem exam which was like a more advanced class i almost failed i almost failed intro physics because i am not good at physics whatsoever and that was a huge blow to my confidence um and for all of my friends at some point whether it happened in your freshman year whether it happens in your sophomore year there was something that would totally destroy your ego because you know everyone has come into MIT being the best in their class you know some people didn't work hard and now here we were you know completely destroyed by our coursework and so that actually led to a lot of like confidence issues a lot of imposter syndrome you know where you see the person next to you and you think that oh they're doing so much better than me i'm so stupid and it was this like vicious honestly like mental vortex so that's not something that i expected whatsoever i did not yeah i didn't expect all of this like men these you know mental challenges and i most certainly didn't expect this course load i think a good um analogy is you don't know how to swim at the end of this semester which is 14 weeks you're expected to be you know an olympian um like as as a joke we would <laughs> we would say like our organic chemistry class is like two of harvard's <laughs> organic chemistry classes it was just so much material the expectations were so high so those were two things that i did not see coming but again like with my friends with mentors and upperclassmen you know i learned how to learn i learned how to study effectively and manage my time and slowly i saw hey i get the hang of this i can do this and i started to excel but it was a extremely difficult process for me and for everybody i knew Um so that was one thing I didn't expect. The other thing I didn't expect was the kinds of people that I would encounter. Um and by that I mean my friends are extremely accomplished. I cannot tell you how good they are at what they do, but they're humble. They have been selfless and just really fun people to be around. And what I found really remarkable is after graduating from MIT, if I needed any professional help, It didn't matter whether I personally knew this alum or not. No one ever said no to me. And so that spirit of being collaborative and supportive, like that has carried on after graduating, and that's not something I could have expected. Like I I thought these people are going to be so smart, and they're not going to talk to me. No, like they really are so humble. They really are so kind. And so I made friends with them and I guess like for any kind of help that I'd need, Um I got that and I try to carry that forward too. Like I try to not say no the best that I can. Um so yeah, that was a huge positive thing. Like I didn't like I would say I've learned how to be a much better person because of the people I met. Yeah. So I hope I hope that answers your question well. 
It does, it does. Thank you so much for sharing um, sharing that with us. So were there, when while you were at MIT, were there any, or maybe even after that, um, was there any challenge or any time when things didn't go as you expected? And how did you deal with that? What did you do to overcome that? Okay, um, so I, I want you guys to know that not everything is rosy, you know? Um, I, again, I'd have to say, in terms of what's happened to me in my life externally, I feel really um, grateful for that. You know, I maybe, you know, there have been some crises along the way. Um, I guess one of them is in my first year. Yeah, I guess like this is um, maybe a good example. Um, in my first year, you know, I came in, there were a lot of professors who were interested in me and I'm like, okay. And I, I really give my best effort in everything I do. I make sure that when I go into a place, I do my best and you know I add value. So I come in in my first year and a lot of things like did not fall into place. Um, so I started to develop some health issues which prevented me from doing my best in my first, uh, my first, we have this rotation system where you spend about like 10 weeks with like three different professors and then, and then it's like, what's a mutual fit? So at the end of the year, you're like, okay, you know, this is working out with me and this professor, I'm going to join their lab. So the first professor I rotated with, um, she was my first choice. She was really excited about me, but because of things that I started to develop, I couldn't do that. So it was very disappointing for her. And I was, and I also like, I also didn't like her, but the fact that I couldn't give my best really bothered me. Um, then with the second professor, she was extremely interested in me and, it, and I'm like, okay, well, she was also, you know, she's my second choice. And then my mom gets extremely sick out of nowhere. Um, she got this rare infectious disease. She was all by herself um, because my dad was traveling a lot for his job. And I dropped everything and I just went back home. I didn't even think twice. And so I took care of her for about a month and again that was at the cost of my of my professional life to be very to be very honest with you but i didn't think about it um i somehow finished my semester i did well in my classes but in terms of research which is really why you're doing a phd that was very compromised and then the month following that i started to have more issues and so the second professor while i completely you know see from her point of view that maybe I'm not, you know, that there was, you know, I wasn't a good student in that time. She didn't give me a second chance. And it was really horrible because she had given so many signs that she was going to take me into her lab over every other student who had, I guess, applied. And so it was extremely hurtful when she defined me by my experiences instead of what I was actually capable of. And it was extremely hurtful because when I had overcome my issues, I gave everything I could to like catch up and I did a good job, I think. I came to her with my results and I don't know what kind of mood she was in, but she just really like tore me apart. She's like, you need hand holding. I thought you were going to be so much better because of your background. And I had never been spoken to like that by any professor. And I was just like heartbroken. And not just that, I started to feel really afraid because I'm like, okay, these were the two people I came for my PhD for. The third person, you know, she didn't have space in her lab anymore. And I'm like, what am I going to do? I've already traveled from Caltech, you know, California all the way to the East Coast. And something I want to mention is my husband now, he also moved, you know, like he's a software engineer. He like, was working at Amazon in the Bay Area and then he comes to the East Coast and thank God everything worked out. You know, now he's at like Google New York, but that was not as likely for that to happen because the tech scene is in California. So here I am like thinking all these thoughts where life was not, life was very difficult. I did my best to do the, you know, to overcome those challenges, but I feel really screwed. I'm sorry, that's the best way of putting it where I don't know what I'm going to do for my PhD. So I'm like, okay, so that so that was a huge challenge. That was a huge challenge. And also on, on the side, I also felt a lot of imposter syndrome because I knew I wanted to come in doing more computer science research. And that's very different from my training. Um, 
this is probably a nuance that you don't understand at the time, but really the way you think as a computer scientist is completely different from the way you think as an experimental biologist or even as an analyst, the way I was trained. And so I'd look around to my peers who were trained in, in CS and I'm like, they're doing projects that I want to be able to do and I have no skills whatsoever. So that was in my head. I'm like, no CS professor is taking me right now. Um, and I like, I just feel really horrible. So then I'm like, okay, what can I do now? <laughs> so as a, like, like I was an undergrad, I emailed every single professor I could in my department, in other departments where I felt like I could remotely even have an interest. Most professors were not taking things in their lab. I went and talked to my Dean of Graduate Studies. I'm like, hey, what do I do? I felt like I'm gonna drop out of a PhD program. And he's like, okay, look, just rotate with Mike Levine. And I'm like, why? I never thought about this. He's an experimentalist. And he's like, okay, we'll do that and be co-advised by Mona, who's basically a CS professor. So I'm like, okay, so I went for it. So that was one way I'm like, that I try to overcome my challenge. Again, nothing is guaranteed, you guys. Nothing is guaranteed. I was not guaranteed to join a lab of my dreams. I was not guaranteed to like even be successful in my research whatsoever because things that were out of my control really, you know, affected me personally, health wise and professionally. But that's just life. You know, so then I'm like, OK, I'm going to make the most out of this. And I was lucky where I really enjoyed my rotation. And it was working out that, you know, Mike, the experimentalist, was pleased. And Mona was very pleased with my progress. But something I'm going to mention to you is it wasn't easy for me to, I guess, like impress them and put, you know, and get them on board. I worked extremely hard. I worked two or three times harder than I would. You know, and what's interesting about co-advising is when I have meetings, I have to express the same idea in two different ways. And I took initiative to like set those meetings up, to do my best job, to get results, and to really demonstrate that I care, that I'm hardworking. So I worked extremely hard because I knew that it was either this or nothing. You know, so I guess like the way I over overcame it is I did my best. I'm not perfect at it by any means to focus on the action items. What do I need to do? And I just did it. You know, I just did those things. And I was also very perceptive of like, what are the things that these professors want to see? Mike, okay, also this is a different story. He is absolutely insane. <laughs> he has strange expectations. He likes to see people working later at night. So I did move my schedule a little bit later so he could physically see my efforts. I, you know, I was working really hard. I wanted him to see that. Mona is very organized she, and I'm also organized. So I would make sure that, you know, when I work with her, she can see that, that I make things systematic for her. So that's actually a piece of advice I'm going to give you like right now. You know, do your best, be extremely diligent. You know, make sure you're the best at what you do technically and be perceptive of the people you're working with. You know, try to, try to get a sense of what is most effective when you work with them. When are they in a good mood? Um, how do you show the best of yourself to these people? Because honestly, from my experience so far, success is more than your technical prowess. You know, so I guess that was a challenge for me. It's like to understand these two different people. How do I communicate with them and how do I do my best? So, so then, you know, things started to look up for me. The other challenge was, you know, my husband has to move. <laughs> you know, like he has to move from California. He has to get a job. So I guess in that way, there wasn't any action item for me, but to just like mentally um, deal with things. So I guess that was another skill that I had to gain. Like, how do I be calm? How do I be patient? How do I kind of like accept what I can change, what I can't change? And how do I just stay focused? And, you know, and I got a lot of support from the people around me again. And I like and I hope that I'm able to reciprocate that now. But at the time, like they really helped me be positive and to stick with it. And and, you know, at the end of the year, things had worked out for me. So I guess there are two things. One is like challenges that life throws at you and then things actually working out. And they did. And I, I really do believe like you have to keep trying and keep sticking it out. Eventually something will work out for you. You don't know when. 
you don't exactly know how, but you have to stick with it. So that's one way that I overcame that challenge. And then there are all these like mental challenges where it's where you learn to deal with like when when your face when life throws things at you, there's also just the challenge of how are you responding to it? And so I took that as a really good opportunity. I mean, it was a really good opportunity for me again to learn patience, to stick with things, to be positive. Yeah, to tell myself that things are going to work out when I don't see them working out um, immediately in, you know, what's in front of me. So, yeah, so that's that's how I overcame it. And I'm glad I got to share that because, yes, you know, out of self-awareness, I can say I do have a lot to, you know, say that I have succeeded professionally thus far, um, but it wasn't easy. And when people seem perfect, when I actually learn about their journeys, when they tell me how it was, they failed a lot. They faced a lot of disappointments. And that's what the path really looks like. And I guess, you know, just as a quick aside, because you might find it interesting, um, we have this event on campus called CVs of Failure, CV of Failures. And we had this like amazing professor who had like two PhDs. It's insane. In, and I think like both like econ and in neuroscience, so his research is like like the social and economic context for like mental like um yeah like mental illness and so we're like oh my god this guy's like absolutely amazing which he was and then he wrote something called CV of failures where he wrote down every single grant that he didn't get every school he got rejected from and all of these things that we wouldn't associate with someone so successful and that like was so humanizing and that's when i really learned that hey this is what the path really looks like you know the more you want to achieve the further you want to go the rockier the road is going to become so you are almost inviting a lot more challenges into your life but again what i also learned is you know if you stick it through if you're positive but really if you stick it through you know you you have to do your best not to give up you know when you're given the support that you need you can overcome a lot. So that was a little long, but I hope that was a good response to that question. No, no, it was absolutely great to hear about your experiences and, and how, especially how you persevered through such hard times. So based on your experiences, do you have any general advice or tips on college life that you think we should follow to be more successful during our time there? Okay, the first thing I'm gonna say is keep your eyes open. You know, have an open mind, like see what your university is offering you and knowing you guys and how well you're doing, you're all going to go to a great place, you know, so like be aware, like just and and, you know, you don't really know what you like until you try things, you know. So again, like given how difficult your course load is for you, if you find that it's like pretty tractable, try classes in things that interest you you know like and, and a good way of kind of um be like being exposed to things is like go for a random seminar you know maybe there's like an undergrad symposium where people are talking about like their research or maybe like there's this really cool i don't know this arts event so like you can go for these different things on campus and be like hey i found this interesting maybe i'll take a class in it or maybe i'll join a club and so that's how you can kind of explore like what you like to do you know what you might be interested in because you'll go in with like a set of expectations which is great right because you have a sense of like okay this is what i like but also be open to other things that might captivate you like one i have to say very ironic thing um is you know i went into mit knowing that i really like biology but again i felt like really insecure like oh computer science is like for all these smart people and you know like having been at MIT, which is like the mecca for the spectrum of computer science, I, I only explored it when I took intro to CS my junior year and I loved it. But by then it had been too late for me to explore that more. So I wish I had, you know, just kind of had an open mind and tried it, even if I didn't think I'd be good at it. And that's actually one piece of advice I'm going to give you right now. Like, don't feel afraid to jump into things um, because you don't feel qualified. Like, honestly, if you, you feel like you're half good enough or even 40 percent, just go for it. You know, like, just try it, you know, because in the real world, you learn things like on the job. 
So that's the first thing, you know, like jump into things, try them. And um, the next thing that I'll say is find, find mentors. You know, I'd say I only had the confidence to reach out, okay, to Professor Sharp because um, my professor undergrad mentor was like, Prakriti, just go and shake his hand. And I'm like, what? I would never do that. And he's like, no, when you meet him, I know you're emailing him and stuff, just go and shake his hand. And maybe that first encounter with him was what got the ball rolling, you know? So having those mentors, when I like failed, when, when I pretty much failed my first chem exam, it was my upperclassman Tuang, who I still lovingly refer to as my big bro, who was like, you know what? sit down, this is how you're going to study. You know, when I felt really like upset about some random thing, my roommate Yiping, who I know now for 10 years and we're still so close, she was a person I could talk to. So I'm going to, I don't know, like, I hope life brings you these friends and these mentors, but when you find them, like really treasure them. Um, because again, from a professional point of view, your mentors are going to guide you. They're going to tell you things that you don't know. They're going to give you a big picture. Um, they're going to give you strategies on how to actually get those opportunities in your life. And friends, honestly, like when I look back at MIT, yeah, I remember the miserable nights, but I really remember the people. I remember staying up at wrong hours of the night, working on these problems and having pizza and laughing about things. You know, um, and I guess the other thing that I'll say is, yeah, focus on having a holistic experience. You know, like people say college is the best four years of your life and enjoy that because it does become a lot harder to find friends and to do things that you're into. You just have to put in a lot more effort. But here college is, you know, offering you these things. Just take them, take them, you know, and and finally, like enjoy the city that you're in. Um, like I know my brother ended up in LA and that in LA has like a really fun food scene and like entertainment. So do things that your city has to offer as well, you know, and travel if you can. Um, again, uh, colleges offer a lot of these opportunities and it's really great for you to be in a different place. So yeah, those are the things that I'd say. Yeah, I mean, make those four years really count. That's I think. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All of that. We there, there definitely needs to be a balance, taking advantage of all the opportunities and then also the other side of making friends and things like that. So definitely we'll keep that in mind. Um, now to a more academic side, um, was the workload at MIT manageable? I mean, I'm sure we can all imagine it was extremely difficult. So what were your personal uh, methods and do you have any tips for us in keeping up with our academic work? Okay, um, just very quickly, um, the average workload of MIT was expected to be like 48 hours a week, um, which is, I forget how many hours we have in a day. I think it's 168. Um, <laughs> I hope I'm not wrong with that multiplication, um, but 48 out of 168 is around like 30% of your time. So it was a lot. And that doesn't include research, although like you could do something clever and use research as a class. Um, but it was a lot of work. It was really, really difficult. Um, so I'll give you some study tips, right? The first thing was like learn understanding how I learned most effectively. OK, different things work for different people, so I'm not going to prescribe you anything. You have to figure that that out for yourself. I'll compare myself to Yiping. OK, I I went for office hours a lot and I highly recommend that. And one thing is don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't let it become an ego thing or a judgment thing of like, oh, I'm so stupid. That's why I need to ask questions or like, oh, that person doesn't need to ask questions. It doesn't matter. Right. The focus is do you understand the material? And going for office hours can be extremely useful. Not all the time. You need to have a good TA, but find them um, and ask them questions. You know, like maybe there's a concept you don't understand. Maybe there was this question that you didn't get. But this is a person who has studied the material, who really knows it, and they can help you understand. You know, if you need a tutor, 
get a tutor, you know, like I used to tutor intro bio and it was interesting because my friends who were so good at CS, they just did not understand like DNA replication. They just did not understand, you know, so I would tutor them and they benefited from that, you know, so if you basically like do the things that help you. Another thing is which hours are you most productive in? You know, I had a friend who was extremely disciplined, which is unusual at MIT. Like, you know, he would like sleep at 10 and like wake up at six and he would be so effective in the morning. Most of us were night people. You know, some people would pull an all nighter and then sleep for 10 hours the next day and then all nighter. You know, some people were most effective between 2 and 6 a.m. Like my husband, for example, which is just like really weird to me, but that, that's what works for other people. You know, do you work well? Like, do you need to study a week in advance for an exam? I needed to do that just to give myself time to simmer things. Or like my roommate, do you just sit for like two days straight and do all the practice problems? You know, and then she would do extremely well. So that's the first thing. Understand when you are most productive and what are the things that help you to be effective. And again, if you are given past past um, problems, like I know you guys have a question bank, do those questions multiple times, okay? Like until, not until you memorize it, that's, that's one trade-off you have to keep in mind. You don't wanna like memorize the answers. You wanna do them enough times until you really get the concepts. Understand that you only know you only know that you understand the concepts once you can solve problems, not if you can remember facts. Um, and this was definitely applicable at MIT where everything is like completely, I guess, um, critical thinking based. There was no memorization like whatsoever. So you really had to know how to play around with those concepts. Um, so those are like the first set of tips. Again, um, something my friend recommended, which is really great, is you wanna take series of notes in that like when you're on lecture, you know, you have, you know, you write whatever you can. Then you want to revisit the material and think about, okay, what were the main ideas? Okay, and then what are the examples of those? Like, um, for example, maybe you, I don't know, did a concept in like thermodynamics, right? Okay, there's this one concept. Now, what are the, what are the questions and answers that correspond to that, con uh, to that, to that concept? Like, first of all, what are the main points? And then what are the questions and answers? You want to do this for every single concept. Then in the third iteration, you want to have the most condensed notes that really boil down to the essence of those concepts. So what does that mean? You have revisited the material multiple times. And that's very, very effective. You don't want to just do it once and then kind of hack your way through problems. No, you want to see it once. You want to see it again, you know, because the more you see it, the more you think about it and do problems. That's when you really absorb the material. So that, that that's a very effective study tool. Um, and the last thing I can think of. Yeah, that's that's pretty much it. So ask questions, reach out for help. Um, do every past problem you can revisit the material multiple times. And most of all, you know, work out of a place of self awareness, like when you are most effective. Oh, and then one thing a perspective I'll give you is guys, it's not about the number of hours you spend. It's the number of meaningful hours that you spend. You know, like in my research, sometimes I spend four hours. Those are the most solid four hours. You'll have to punch me in the face to get my attention. Other days, it'll be 10 hours. You know, so it's not like I'm working like, okay, eight hours every single day. You know, I'm on Facebook for like two of those hours. No, it's like every hour that you put in to study, you want it to be a solid hour. And that's also how you make time for yourself to do other things, right? So think about the trade off. Like if you have, you know, like four crappy hours, you know, then you just missed out on two hours of doing something else. You know, like let's say you had two solid hours, then hey, now I can spend two hours like dancing. I can spend two hours like going to Boston and like eating at my favorite hot pot place and come back. So that's also like an incentive for you to be effective so that you can spend your time doing like other meaningful things. So yeah, so I guess that's the last thing, time management. Have a schedule, stick to it. That really helps. All that advice is definitely great, especially the note system and the difference between like 
productive hours versus like the number of hours. So I think a lot of it also depends on the type of education you receive, like how much time you put into it after. So is the education mostly theoretical or are there really hands on opportunities to take advantage of? So it really depends on your school. You know, um, like one clear distinction that I can make is MIT was extremely applied, um, but you could also be theoretical if you wanted. You know, like let's say you're studying computer science. You could, you know, if you want, spend a lot of your time, you know, doing proof based work. You could spend a lot of your time learning about Turing machines, you know, like different autonomy, right? Or, and, and most people were on the applied side, you know, where you are solving real world problems with algorithms and then you're coding it up, you know? So there was that whole spectrum where people really, but most people really kind of were in the more applied side. You know, compared to Caltech, which is overall a very theoretical institution. So if you're majoring in computer science, you are hardly programming, actually. Um, when I took their algorithms class, it was like a hardcore math class, really, where we were, you know, we were given, you know, different flavors of your basic algorithms, you know, and then we had to prove them. And that was very difficult, you know? So that was like completely theoretical. So it really depends on your school and you want to be aware of that. Um, yeah, like maybe yes, but most schools like have that spectrum, which is really good and flexible. So I think like maybe what I'm saying is very specific to Caltech. Even Princeton is more on the theoretical side. Um, so it depends. Like at MIT, we had everything. But yeah, keep an eye, eye, eye out for that and try both because um, very different ways of thinking or I mean not very like not totally, but very different experiences in interacting with the subject material. Absolutely, we'll definitely keep that in mind. Um, so while you were an undergrad, how easy was it to find things like internships and research opportunities? And how did you go about um, taking advantage of those? OK, so I'll say two things. Again, it's very school dependent, guys. and. What you want to do is you want to figure out the best strategy for getting those opportunities. Um, I'm going to be honest with you at MIT. We had our, in our career fair, you know, companies would come and they would really try to recruit us. So it was very easy over there in terms of research. Again, like everybody who was interested in research that just did research. So these opportunities were just very blatantly there. You know, you just had to be interested and you could do them. And it also depends on what kinds of opportunities, right? Like obviously MIT is a very science and engineering heavy school. Other science and engineering heavy schools will also make these things like very clearly visible. But maybe if you're at a larger school, you'll have to work harder in some ways. And I think that's what I mean by you want to have upperclassmen and mentors help you because it's challenging. It's more challenging in some respects where you have a lot more people who are competing for the same thing. Um, it will be, you know, it'll be harder for you to get recruiters attention, you know, so you have to spend a lot more time, you know, trying to hunt those recruiters down. So I think like a, a this is, I think this is maybe, I think the most valuable piece of honest opinion advice I can give you is so much of your success depends on personal connections and networking. Like it is so true, you guys. Don't wait for someone to come and give an opportunity to you. You go look for that opportunity and you persevere until you get it. Um, and I'm confident in saying this because Professor Sharp, once I joined his lab, was like, take this as a lesson. Perseverance pays off. And so I will share the anecdote for how I got into his lab. And what I hope you appreciate is so much of it did not have to do. Actually, none of it had to do with what I was technically bringing into the lab, like my actual like technical skills. It was definitely a combination of luck and me just not giving up whatsoever. So again, when I came into MIT, I didn't have research experience. Um, there were high school students who did, you know, like someone there were a few who published papers you know or like they won this research thing or that thing and i didn't have any of that you know i mean i did a great internship in bangalore though which was a really valuable experience 
Um, but it wasn't like what these high school students had accomplished, which is actually overrated to some extent, but that's a different conversation. And so, you know, I came in, I didn't even know what research was, but it sounded like something cool. And so, as I said, I talked to my undergrad mentor and he was like, okay, you know what? When you see him, you just go and shake his hand. And, you know, his grad student lives in your dorm. You should meet Albert. So what I was doing at the same time like it wasn't just professor sharp we have a cancer research center at mit i emailed every single professor in that building three times you guys i'm not kidding you know i emailed them first didn't get a response which is understandable i emailed them again i didn't get a response so i'm like okay this isn't effective so again i was doing two things at once one was like trying to get something at all so then, a grad, so then here's, I think, a good thing that I did. I asked people questions. I try to, you know, figure out what did they do to get their research opportunity. So a grad student in, in my dorm was like, you know what? Um, people are really busy. You should go to their office with, with your resume. So I did that, you know, like for whichever professors who had responded or even not. I went with my resume, you know, I spoke with the assistant. I'm like, hi, I'm a freshman. I'm really interested in this lab. Here's my resume. And again, how many people responded out of like 30, maybe three to five, you know? Um, and then I'm like, okay, well, I have to keep trying. So yeah, so that's what I kept doing. And then with Professor Sharp, I met the grad student, Albert, and I went in having done my homework. Guys, this is another thing. You before you talk to someone, you want to know their background, you know, so I knew like what Albert was working on. I knew what splicing was. I was ready to like go through the pathway. I was ready to have as intelligent of a conversation as I could. So when I talked to Albert, I wasn't a waste of his time. I was able to demonstrate to Albert that, hey, I'm actually interested in this. I don't know much. And again, guys, like be honest about what you don't know. Be confident in what you know. But don't lie about what you don't know. Like that will fall apart very quickly, especially when you interact with, I don't know, the best people in your field, they will see through you. So be honest about what you know. So I'm like, hey, Albert, you know, this is all I know, but it's really interesting to me. And so I talked to him, okay? And then it turns out that he had a conversation with, you know, my mentor, like my grad student mentor about like, oh my gosh, Prakriti just like went through this entire pathway. You should take her. But of course I didn't know that, right? So then I'm like, okay, so by the time I met Albert, it had been a month where I had nothing. And I'm like, okay, well, I talked to Albert. And then, and then this is what I mean by luck, okay? I go for this bio seminar. I was late. And so all the seats in the back had been filled up. So I go and sit in the front awkwardly and in front of me was Professor Sharp. And, and so I'm like, oh my God, I'm so nervous. I recognize him. And at the end of the seminar, I took my undergrad mentor's advice. He's like, go shake his hand. And I did. I did. I didn't really have anything meaningful to say. I'm just like, hi, I'm really interested in your lab. I have reached out. And it was really cool. He's like, oh yeah, I think I remember you. Albert mentioned me to you. And so I'm like, hey, that's real. That, that's that's cool. I email him again. He doesn't respond. OK, so I'm like, OK, well, I'll just keep trying. And then maybe there was there was something that was like kind of working out at that point. I just wanted something. I just wanted to jump into research at all. Um, and then a month later, I get contacted by Mohini, who ended up being my, you know, the person who trained me in research. And she's like, hey, I'm a grad student here. Um, you know, if you want to talk, um, you know, just drop by. And I was really excited. I couldn't believe it. So I did go and I talked to her again. I was honest because on my resume, you guys, I didn't have any like research competition winner first place type thing. No, I confidently wrote everything that I did in TISB because I was so proud of it. You know, I I was honest about what I knew and what I didn't. I didn't know anything, frankly. And what got me there in the end was my enthusiasm and the fact that I demonstrated that I was going to work really hard. So it was a combination of those two things. I really persevered and there was a lot of luck. Even how I got into Professor Yamanaka's lab, 
you know, I had a friend, a grad student friend who was a postdoc there. I reached out to him and I left a good impression on him and then he advocated for me. And then I went and gave a really solid, you know, research presentation and I got hired. So that's the thing, you know, like it was really those personal connections and those random things that helped me get there, but I was poised to take advantage of it. Here, I'll give myself credit. I had done my homework. I had a, I had accumulated experience. I, I did deserve being there to do my best work. And I proved that over and over again. And again, like you want to be someone who people like, who respect you and who like you. You want to be friendly with people. And also when you don't get along with people, remember this, like don't burn any bridges. You never know whose help you might need. You know, so remember, keep that in mind too. You know, you want to be someone who can build relationships positively. You want to be someone who people respects. You want to be someone who can help other people and who people want to help you. You know, so it's these random things, guys, that really make a difference. But keep your eyes open. Don't give up ever. You know, have this attitude of like, I will not give up until I get what I want. And of course, you will not get what you want all the time. But go in with the attitude of I am not going to give up. And be sincere, be hardworking, you know, and be smart. Be smart, be strategic. So I know that was a long answer, but I genuinely want you to know what the real world is actually like. You want to be the absolute best at what you do and you want to be intelligent. You want to know how to navigate the professional space that you're in. And the way to know those things is to get mentors. So find yourself good professors and upperclassmen who will tell you those things and who will vouch for you will put in a good word for you to help get those opportunities. Yeah. I think we can all take a leaf out of your book, seeing how proactive you were in approaching all these professors and making such connections. So I think we'll move on to some audience questions now uh, as we have quite a bit of them. So the first one is what were some of your extracurricular activities at school that you think helped you in college, especially in terms of research? And we've also had some people asking what were your IB scores if you're comfortable sharing them? OK, um, so I would say so th there are two things. One, um, so I did drama, which I loved. Um, I danced, I sang, I was in the play. Um, and so what those activities help me to do is one to realize that I'm interested in doing like pursuing these even as a hobby in college. Um, but also like when I think about it, the first nascent um, uh, experiences for me to know how to manage my time. I think one thing that was interesting at TISB is, well, I guess like the slots are kind of um, made for you. I don't know what it's like for you guys now, but it's like from this time to this time, you have this activity from that time to that time, you have that activity. But what I mean by ta time management is again, like how do I give myself a hundred percent like when I'm in prep time, how do I make sure I'm doing everything like that? I'm working effectively so that when I'm when I'm in that time block to do my extracurriculars, I'm not stressed out. You know, I can just enjoy drama for drama. I'm not like worried about like, oh, my God, I didn't do those problems. I procrastinated. So that was one thing. Um, the other thing, again, which I feel really grateful for is um, I got this research um, internship at in vitro. So there was um, there was a student whose parents had a biotech company. And so I spent my summer basically learning how to do plant tissue culture. Um, yeah, I learned all these, you know, these different techniques, uh, like what, you know, what they were doing. And that was that was a great experience. You know, I think maybe that was something that made me realize, hey, I, I like the research, like I like doing things with my hands. I don't do any experiments now, but I'm like, I, I enjoy this. I enjoy this process. And again, I just really loved science. Like I loved bio HL. I loved math HL, even though I really struggled with that, to be honest. Um, and that's and again, like I I guess I could just feel that I like problem solving. I like spending time thinking about things. I like being creative with my subject material. So I would say it's a combination of you know, those two things of like, you know, having done that internship 
And then just like recognizing like a strong interest in my technical subjects. And in terms of like IV scores, um, I got like a 42 overall. Um, I'd say the most notable. Um, yeah, so I took four HLs. I did like um, bio, chem, math, and history. And then SL, I had French ab initio and English. Um, I think the most notable grade for me was I got a seven in history HL, which I thought was like really cool. And then my other subjects, it was like a mix of sixes and sevens. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, we have someone who is also seems to uh, want to learn about this in interdisciplinary idea that you've um, sort of taken with your career and they ask um, what advice would you give to someone who loves theoretical research in computer science but also loves building stuff? So what sort of a career path would you say combines those two? OK, so I'll speak to the interdisciplinary part. So biology, like at the mechanistic level, is very complicated. It's real, like, you know, I'm sure you guys know about transcription. We still don't really know how it works in the sense that, like, which DNA elements actually interact with the promoter? How do they interact? When do they interact? Um, what are the different proteins involved? Like those mechanistic questions are very difficult to answer. Um, and I would say in those class of questions, you know, doing experimental biology is the way to start answering those questions. But now there are interesting techniques in like imaging or there are ways now to study the thermodynamics of these processes. And, and so basically you have a biological question, but you come in with a different lens of thinking about how to answer that question. So, so it's really interesting where, you know, in the past you would have an experimental biologist, you know, do their experiment, then using, you know, whatever tools are available, like maybe doing PCR on a certain, on a certain DNA element, you know, by knocking this out or by overexpressing this, what are the differences? Like that's how a biologist tends to think, okay? But then maybe the physicist will be like, hey, you know, given, given my predictions, yeah, like, you know, given what these interactions can be, um, one kind of interaction is more likely than the other, all right? Or maybe you'll have, and what's really interesting, like, yeah, you, physicists are doing a lot of cool things where it's like, hey, Maybe this how this is how you can image this process. Then maybe you have a chemist who comes in and is like, okay, let me develop a new protocol to you know to gather more new kinds of data. So this is you know this is what interdisciplinary research is like. And and you know and and then if you can be a person who can think with two different lenses. That's what it means to be an interdisciplinary researcher, where you're looking at the problem from different lenses to try to answer it. And then another thing like, you know, like now there's all this like big data analysis where now you have all these huge databases of different biological things. You know, how do you make sense of that data? So now, you know, applying deep learning or machine learning techniques to, you know, to analyze that data is becoming extremely popular. You know, and that comes from someone with a computer science background. So so when you're doing both, that makes you an interdisciplinary thinker, you know, and so this applies to so many disciplines. But since I'm in biology, I can speak to what it means to be an interdisciplinary um, researcher for that. Now, in terms of like theoretical and practical um, research, so I'm not totally sure um, if I can answer that question the best. Um, but from my limited experience, I mean, it's just really different, um, like just really different um, sets of questions that you're asking and how you're answering them. So I don't know how you might meld the two, but my advice would be like definitely to try research in both and then see if you like one more than the other or, you know, see if there's a professor on campus who is doing both. Um, to kind of see what that interface would be like. Because in general, like theory and. Um, 
I guess I can give you one example that comes to mind from like a biology perspective. Um, people are really interested in causal graphs. So the idea is, you know, you have, let's say, um, object A, which is affecting object B. Object B is affecting object C. And you want to basically map these interactions over time, okay? And so if you apply it to in a biological context, it's like, okay, you have these different, you know, these different proteins. This is how they interact. How can I infer these interactions from, you know, from data that I have about their levels at different times? So there's a professor. Yeah, actually, maybe this is a good example of, um, of an intersection. So she, you know, is modeling this process using a lot of concepts in graph theory. Okay. And she, and, and, you know, she goes through um, the theoretical basis for her thinking, you know, so she's, you know, she's writing proofs for, for the logic behind making these inferences. But why is it practical? Because then she applies, you know, her research, you know, these different abstractions to real data, you know, data that, you know, experimentalists have generated. So this is an example where, of like where you start from a theoretical point of view, but again, it's circular, you know, like you have to understand the data, you have to understand the biology in order to abstract things effectively. So you have that kind of exposure, then you go through the theory of your abstraction, and then you apply it to see if you're right. And how do you know if you're right? Either you do the experiment, that's uncommon. It's, I don't know, I think it's like really difficult to do both, depending on what kind of experience you're doing, but you know, you make some predictions and you have a biologist validate them. Like, were you right? So I, I think that's an example, but really in other fields, you just kind of want to be aware of what professors are doing. Yeah. So I think that was a very interesting and helpful perspective to hear. So the next question says that to a lot of us, MIT seems like this inaccessible beacon of knowledge that's unlike any other institution in the world. Wow. How valid how valid do you think this notion is and to what extent do you think experiences at other universities are similar? Um, yeah, I mean, MIT really is an exceptional place that that is true. Um, it really is a beacon of knowledge and. You know, so many science and engineering fields definitely, you know, maybe every single engineering field. Um, but that doesn't mean that other institutions are not, you know, beacons of knowledge in, in the same things. Like in terms of computer science, you know, Carnegie Mellon, you know, I mean, they have, if I remember correctly, like they have an entire, you know, um, department or branch, you know, just for computational biology. MIT doesn't have that, you know, or they have like an institute for like just machine learning, you know. Um, then, of course, you have Stanford CS. You know, um, and you know, as you like, entrepreneurship is a really big thing in the Bay Area. So it's really interesting. You see CS people kind of turning their ideas into, you know, in different startups. You know, so you know, MIT isn't like the one place. No, it has its strengths, and so do other schools. The best way to get a sense of that is to see actually, you know, what are the professors doing? You know, like like. Are they, you know, like, are they good teachers? You know, what kinds of classes are offered? Yeah, like sometimes, you know, if you look at like a computer science major, you can get a sense of what you might experience through like what your coursework will be like. You know, if you look at Caltech CS curriculum, you'll be like, okay, this is gonna be really mathy, you know? Um, then there's, if you're interested in like computational biology, MIT has like something that's kind of bringing the two together, but then Carnegie Mellon has a solid, you know, major just focused on that, you know? So you want to, you know, like you want to understand different universities. They're really strong in their own ways. Um, and in terms of it being inaccessible, like, yeah, it's a brutal place, but again, like the people there are really friendly, um, at least among us grad, like undergrads. I hear that grad school is a lot more competitive, but yeah, people are like undergrads are really friendly. It's not, you know, a scary place socially as much as you might think. Academically, yes, it's terrifying, you know, but I don't know. That's like a different thing altogether. Um, 
And there was another part of this question that I can't remember. Um, yeah, I mean, what was possible. like the last part? To what extent do you think experiences at other universities are similar to your experience at MIT? Yeah, so I can't like totally speak, you know, for other um, universities. So you really have, you know, honestly, the best way to find out is you talk to people who go there. You know, you ask them the same questions that you're asking me. And I think that's the best way to like kind of compare and contrast. Again, like I could, I could really just truly speak for like Caltech, MIT and Princeton because I've spent time there. I think, yeah, I mean, they're similar academically, I guess. I mean, Princeton's a lot easier for me, um, just like from grad school classes, but I came in with a background. Yeah, Caltech and MIT are both extremely brutal. And yeah, no, and actually when I talk to, yeah, when I talk to like my friends at other top institutions, it's not that they, um, like you can opt in for that kind of brutality, but at Caltech and MIT, that's like the baseline. So it's like you can't opt out of it being really difficult academically. Um, so I guess like that's, that's really like the most I can say. And also like if you, if you get into MIT, I'm going to be very honest, like ask yourself, is science and engineering like the thing I want to spend most of my time doing? Because yes, like I had a holistic experience and other people did too, but it's it's a, it's so much harder to do that. It's so much harder to do that because the environment does not support you in like your well-being or having a balanced life. Like you have to work really hard to make that happen for yourself. Um, so yeah, for like kids who get in, like really think about that because it's, yeah, so actually one difference is um, people just had a lot more free time, to be honest with you. They had a lot more free time than us. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, that is definitely something to keep in mind and also what you, how you spoke about, you know, different universities having different advantages and just like, you know, looking for what you want and then applying depending on that as well. And I think that's definitely something important. Um, so someone asks, what do you think differentiated you um, from other applicants applying to MIT? All right, guys, I'm going to be so honest with you. Um, I was I was talking to Ms. Bri about this right before. Um, things are just extremely competitive in that you have so many talented students, really, and too few spots. Um, my friends and I, we are so candid in that if we were to reapply now, we don't know if we would get in. And in fact, the first time you apply, you don't know if you're going to get in. I can't really tell you like what differentiated me from someone who was probably equally better than me, but didn't get lucky. So I, I'm going to be honest, I don't think there really is that one thing that made me so special. All I can say is I worked my hardest at TISB. I, I, whatever I did, I sincerely loved those things. I never did it to get into college, which by the way, I think is really pointless because you know, this is just a, a statistics thing where you're probably not gonna get into most of your top choices just because things are competitive. So guys, don't take it personally. Don't take it personally if you don't get admitted to most places. It's not you, it's it's just by virtue of the fact that there are too many good people now. And so given this statistic, don't do things to try to get into one place. It's really pointless. So I would say that like whatever I did at TISB, I genuinely love those things. And I was really honest in my essays. I really liked the kinds of questions that MIT asked me. I think it really tried to get at like my character and how I look at life or challenges. And I wrote those things sincerely, you know, so I guess like the overall picture was something that MIT liked, but I bet there were 10, 20, I don't know, n number of applicants who were like me too. So, so that's, and I guess like I would segue into that piece of advice for you, do your best, do your best and then give the rest up to life. As long as you know that you did your best, you know, and if you keep doing your best, I believe like you will achieve like the things that you want. The path may not be linear. It might not start off the way you want. So you have to keep going. Don't take failure personally. Because again, guys, there are just too many good applicants. 
you know, so you just have to keep going. You have to keep doing your best. Yeah, so I, I don't think there was one thing that was especially special about me. I think I did my best and I got lucky. And I'd say that for everything that followed. So I think that's some really important advice. We always need to keep in mind what you said. So to end, um, this is the last question. And so to end on a lighter note, how is the social life at MIT, keeping in mind that you're located at Boston? Um, OK, so. Of course, I spent most of my time <laughs> doing homework with my friends, but that was an awesome social life. I know that sounds weird, but we would eat pizza together. We would do homework together and in the process we'd laugh about things. You know, we would have fun with things or maybe we we're like, screw this and we would just go and play in the snow. OK, not me. I hate snow, but you know, like we would just be like, ah, oh, you know, let's just go like to this random event or do something fun. You know, so I had a great social life at MIT. The people I met were so awesome and we're still close now. Um, in general, what you'll find is like undergrads don't actually leave campus that much during the semester. Um, and that's true for most places, you know, like my brother was in LA. Um, he didn't go out like that often. Um, my friends at Stanford, like they didn't actually go out to SF that often. Um, so, you know, like being in Boston, it, it's just like by virtue of being an undergrad, you don't really like go out that much. But when we did go out, like my dorm loved to eat. So we would go and like have hot pot in Boston. Boston has a pretty good food scene. It's improved a lot over the past, you know, like few years. Um, we would, you know, go to the Prudential Center or, you know, walk around in Boston Commons and like watch a play. So when we did have time and like summers was the best time to do it. Yeah, like that's when we would explore the city. Um, another th cool thing about the East Coast is you can take a bus and go to other um, cities. So sometimes we go to New York. Um, I'm really happy that I live close to New York because I can do a lot of cool things. So that's so I guess that's the thing, you know, like I think if you have great friends, you're going to enjoy your social life no matter what. And when you have the time, yeah, go out and do cool things in the city. Again, my brother like got to see, you know, like celebrities, you know, like outside of UCLA, which is really cool, you know, like that's not something that I could have. But my friends who went to Columbia or NYU, you know, they were like embedded in the city. So I guess it depends. Yeah, I mean, definitely I, we all, uh, of course, we do want to do well academically, but socially as well. So it's really nice to hear that you had such an amazing experience um, while you were at college. So I think we're done with the questions. Um, before we end, is there anything you would like to say? Um, well, first of all, thanks for having me. I appreciate that. Um, I hope I could have been helpful or useful. Um, because I, I feel like it's a good perspective for you guys to have about how the real world really works. Um, and I guess that's something I would say, like enjoy high school, enjoy college. In some ways, it's a really maybe protected kind of existence in that like you can just focus on your friends. You can like focus on what you're passionate about and explore things. After you graduate, things become different. You know, you have to put in a lot more effort you know, to see your friends. You have to put in a lot more effort to think about what you want to do after job, after your, you know, after work or after lab time. You know, you start to think about paying your rent, <laughs> you know. So really, really enjoy this time. You know, really enjoy, you know, what you can do because um, it, it changes. And for you guys right now, for the people you know, who like between, you know, and like all of you have to do extremely well academically. I like I'd say, OK, yeah, like to be very real, you have to do basic things to get your foot in the door. Um, they're not going to have much weight afterwards, but it's like it's like a it's necessary, but not sufficient. Like make sure that you have like perfect IV scores. Um, I mean, not to not to like denigrate myself, but you know, like I had a six in math HL. It wasn't a seven, you know, I just like a six in chem HL. It wasn't a seven. That's not bad. It's just keep in mind that the kids you're applying, who you're competing with, they probably have sevens and everything. 
you know, so make sure you can be that person the best you can. I'm not saying it's going to totally disqualify you. Um, like at MIT, like there were people with like a 2200 SAT score. Like I was one of them. I'm not good at testing. So it's like you want to be good enough. You know, like once you have like a 22 or a 23, like you're fine. You know, don't fixate so much on improving your SAT score. So make sure your academics are really solid. You know, like you need to have that. And then yes, you know, like whatever extracurriculars you do, make sure you are the best at them, you know? And again, like colleges take things into perspective, right? So they're going to, I guess, like normalize for your situation. Like a very clear example is if you're an international student who's who's coming from, like, um, like my husband, for example, um, he's Kenyan, so he comes from a system that's very similar to the one in, in India, where it's completely rank based, right? Like you have a national exam and then you have a rank. Um, every single, you know, international student I encountered who came from that system, okay? Um, TISB is different. So if you're an international student from TISB, it's a different standard, okay? But for these international kids, um, they were like top five in the country, you know, but they didn't have like other extracurricular activities, you know, so so when they applied, let's say to MIT, it's not like MIT was like, oh, you didn't have any extracurriculars. I'm going to, you know, totally write you off. No, it's like this was the context you were in. This is how you were judged. You did extremely well in that context. So we're going to consider you as someone will admit compared to, you know, there's this high school in the US which is like science and engineering focused. And there everybody is really good at science and engineering. There are so many extracurricular activities. So everyone is doing everything. So the standard that's going to be applied to them is going to be very different. Colleges are going to be like, OK, well, you have 50 of these opportunities. How many of them did you take advantage of? And how many of them were you the best at? So that's another thing, guys. It's not just quantity. Or just like it's it's about quality, you know, like and you want to find like if there is an opportunity for you to be the best in something, make sure you are, you know, like if like, uh, yeah, like um, you guys have inner school sports events, right? If you are a runner, make sure you are the best runner <laughs> that you can win as many of these inter school things as possible because schools are going to look at, you know, your context and be like, hey, did basically did this person meet their absolute best potential given what they could have achieved? You know, so make sure you are the best at what you do. No question about it. And then finally, like rec letters are so influential. So how do you get a good rec letter? You be again the best and you be sincere about it. You know, I'm not saying like be a teacher's pet, but be a student who is kind and diligent and works hard and does well. Those are things that like every teacher wants to see in their students. They want to see a humble student, a helpful student. You know, so that's how you get good rec letters. So, you know, and again, like internships, you guys, like if you can find, you know, like things that are of interest or relevance to what you want to do, just go for it. And again, be the best at it. So that's really the piece of, of advice that I'm going to tell you that is relevant for your current time like where you are right now. Be the best in school and whatever you other stuff you do, be the best in that, you know, and overall give it your absolute best potential, not 100%, like 150%, you know, given what your potential can be, do that. And then, and then you like, you apply, you do your best and, you know, see what, see what life um, reciprocates to you. But if you know that you did your best, like don't take it personally. And oh, and a final good piece of advice is look at the people who are getting admitted now, you know, from Bangalore. What are they like? I think that will be really useful advice, you know? Um, people who got admitted from TISB, what did they do? You know, maybe kids who are getting invite who are getting admitted from Indus or like other international schools, what are they like? So that will also kind of give you a sense of calibration in terms of, OK, these are the kinds of students that colleges like from where I'm from. So so in that way, you can do like an effective comparison.
yeah so i guess that's that's my advice yeah and just be grateful guys be grateful for what you have you know a lot of us you know life has dealt us really good cards be grateful for it and do things that are meaningful to you yeah definitely thank you so much for that i mean really, really relevant to us and i think really important i, I hope everyone's taking notes because definitely oh, inspiring. um so again thank you so much for being here and spending your time talking to us and telling us about all the things that you've learned um and um I think some people have asked how they could keep in contact with you. So hopefully if they ask us some questions, we'll forward it to your email. Mm -hmm. And um, again, thank you so much for um, spending time with us and thank you to everyone who attended. I think we're probably going to end the session now. So um, goodbye everyone. And again, thank you. Thanks guys.